Hi, I'm Dr. Lila Proenza. And I'm Dr. Miranda Siddhar. And, and this, this is, is How We Think Ahead. ahead. Today, we're going to be talking to you about everything histopomorphs, everything with our guinea pigs and our chinchillas, from getting comfortable with the basics to doing anesthesia and basic surgical procedures, intubation, mm -hmm. dental procedures, space, neuters, urinary diseases, respiratory diseases, the sneaky unrecognized killers like cardiovascular disease. For sure, ER, we're going to talk about CPR. We're also going to talk about imaging and blood work interpretation, as well as husbandry techniques, because it's always important in our small mammal species. If you are a veterinary professional, either a veterinarian or a technician or a student, this course is certainly for you. For more information, Hello, Vera Headers. How are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? I hope you're doing well. This is Dr. Lila Proessa here with you. I hope you're doing well. I am on Instagram. I am on the, it's not webinar, it's Vera Head. Um, and I have, today I have two cameras. Today we're trying something new. Welcome, welcome. If you guys are here, tell me hi. Say hi in the comments. Instagram, say hi in the comments. Everybody here with me on the webinar, not webinar, <laughs> say hi. Tell me where you're from. Tell me where you're from. So today we are is starting uh, a new journey together. Uh, we are going to be learning about blood, blood sampling and zoo med exotic or exotic animals. You just watched a video for our newest course, which is the historical morph course Dr. Sadar and I teach about chinchillas and guinea pig medicine and surgery. But today we're going to be kind of learning about all of them, right? We're going to be learning about birds, reptiles. Uh, we're going to be learning about mammals. We're going to be learning about how to take blood samples. Hello from Peru. Hello from India. Guys, who is here on... Um, whoops. Guys, who is here on StreamYard? Who is here on the webinar? Come here. Do you see everybody here? Ashley Marina. Oh, my goodness. Hello, Ashley. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Hi. So today we're going to, as I said, we're going to be talking about ooh, Mexico. John Bustamante, Mexico. We're going to be talking about blood sampling. We're going to be talking about reptiles, birds, and mammals. If you're on Instagram with me, I'm going to be here just for a little bit. It's still go to our link in the bio is a free webinar right now going on just go there you can still hop on the webinar to watch everything oh my god mexico portugal daniela rodriguez portugal so many of you from the entire world that's so cool as i said we're gonna be trying something new today okay so bear with me today we are going to be croatia okay today we're gonna be trying something new we're going to be trying to show things in a different way and to be more engaged, to be more productive, to hopefully um, enhance learning for all of us. Um, so we are going to try, one, to use two cameras. Look how fancy I am. I'm not here and I'm also here. So we're going to be trying to do both of those. Um, and hopefully, we. oh my God, guys. Oh my God, guys. This is going to be tricky. See, I'm going to be using this one. Um, amazing things, which are our blood sampling and zoom at patients do you guys have difficulties tell me which one is the animal that you have more difficulty collecting blood from i know mine i know mine right away i know mine <laughs> it is not difficult at all uh mine is guinea pigs omg uh, i don't want dr sadar to hear this but it is true okay to me Guinea pigs, I'm a tendon, Achilles tendon, although I learned something in our community that I believe to be super helpful. It's an, a new method to collect blood. Birds, really? Wow, okay, birds. Um, you know, hopefully today you're not going to find uh, it difficult to collect from birds. Um, and, and I will also 
And now Carmine, Greece, oh my God, Grecia, um, Chelonians, Chelonians can be hard. It can be hard, I agree. But hopefully today we, you will uh, learn some techniques. Geckos are really hard, okay? We're going to talk about geckos today. So hold your questions, okay? Have your questions ready because we will, uh, Tunisia, oh my God, I want to go to Tunisia. Please take me to Tunisia. Okay, so guys, from uh, let's start talking about this. So first of all, I just want to tell you, if you are here with us, send this link to a friend that needs to learn about blood sampling, okay? Send this video to a friend because, you know, all of us need to learn a little bit uh, more or less about collecting blood from the species because a lot of what we can do relies on having diagnostic tests, right? Relies on having that sample, relies on being able to analyze that sample. And then, of course, relies on us being able to interpret that sample as well. But today we're going to focus on um, how we can collect the sample. So send this link to one of your friends that needs to learn. If you're here on Instagram, hamsters that is hard if you hear me instagram i'm gonna say bye bye to you now uh go to the link on the bio send it to a friend share with a friend and go see us there okay bye bye instagram okay guys so it's just us now and i'm gonna actually take this phone away because it becomes very hard <laughs> trying to juggle it Let's juggle all of this. It's hard. Um, so the first thing i want to talk to you guys in terms of collecting blood is that we need to sell ourselves ourselves for ugh. we need to sell i can't do this is a it's gonna be a whole thing of bloopers <laughs> we need to set ourselves for success yay background noise um and when i say that first of all we need to make the patient immobile right the patient can't move if the patient moves then we are not going to be able to do anything right that's just how it is um because patients moving don't allow for us to hit the target. And a lot of times we're talking about really tiny patients, really tiny veins, or veins there we don't want to do blindly. Like chelonians, a lot of times we not we don't see the vein necessarily. We go through anatomies and landmarks. Uh, the same thing sometimes when we collect from the tail vein, uh, from lizards, when we collect from juggler a lot of times. Uh, Crina vena cava in ferrets. So definitely want to make sure that these patients are not, are not by any means um, moving. And for that, we need sedation. Okay. Sedation is really, really, really important, guys. Um, sedation is what is going to make us able to collect samples, do physical exams, take x rays, et cetera, et cetera. Don't be afraid to sedate. This is not going to be. Um, today's topic. This is not what we're talking about today, but um, oh, I think I lost the camera. Not sure. It's back. <laughs> today's not going to be talking about sedation, but if you want to learn about sedation, I highly, highly recommend that you check out our um, VetaHead uh, membership. That's where we have all our courses, online courses. We have so, so, so many, um, so many hours. They're always approved. And then we teach you how to sedate, how to anesthetize, even how to collect blood samples, how to restrain, because it's all part of it, right? If you don't know how to restrain, if you don't know how to sedate, how are you going to collect the blood? And then also how are you going to interpret the blood? So we're going to, we teach you that. So I've got ahead, we have the essentials membership that you see right here. And we also have the VetHack community. Essentials membership, guys, what we do is our courses. You have our eBooks, our calculators, emergency calculators. You have all the illustrations, all of that, tons of videos, tons of pictures. Um, and in the community is a way for us to link together. That's actually in the community is where I learned from one of one Veta header, Carolina. She taught me a really amazing technique to collect blood from guinea pigs. She, she taught all of us actually. So we can, uh, we have a lot of video calls, um, topic rounds, case discussions. We have a lot of networking, mental health chats. It's really, really cool, okay? And if you're really interested in sedation and all species, I truly recommend our membership. You can watch the emergency care, our course on emergency care for Zoom patients. There we teach you how to sedate. We have a table, 
we have a table with sedations protocols for all for most common uh, Zoomat pets, right? And I can't say all because there's so many, so many animals in the world. Uh, but that is great. And then if you want to dig uh, even deeper, then we have the online course only for uh, rabbits where we teach intubation, anesthesia, surgery. We also have the hysterichomorph course, chinchillas and guinea pigs also with dive really deep we have a backyard chicken course coming i'm so happy and we also have a reptile course coming it's so a lot of amazing things for for you guys okay so if you are not yet there uh it's time to be there because you're missing out if you're not so one of the things that um again we talked about sedation it's not going to be our focus today but obviously you all know it's a very important. Without sedation, guys, it's going to be so, so hard. It is really hard to kill something with midazolam. I will say that. Besides, midazolam, so, so, so brave. Kami, thank you. Thank you. Kami, when I look at this camera, then you change the cameras. Camila says, I've started the rabbit course and it's really good. I have learned a lot. I'm still telling them a secret, Kami. I need this camera right here because I'm whispering to them, okay? Guys, we need to be a little braver with technique, with studying, and attempt to do sedation. When I started, I was very afraid to do sedation. I started with really protocols. There were light sedation to the point that I realized it was not really helping me and I became a little braver, a little braver to the point today I heavily sedate everything. It made my life so much easier because then I can do things without rushing, without an animal screaming and in my team feels way more comfortable as well. So I highly, strongly recommend you do that. The second thing I want to tell you guys is that we need to have the correct equipment, okay? So correct equipment, if you already see Zoomed, and every time I say Zoomed, guys, it means exotic animals, okay? So I've been intubating like a pro since your training. <gasps> it's amazing. Uh, Ten Ten recommend. Ashley, I'm so happy. Oh, my God. It made my day. It made my day. I love that. Ashley, thank you for making this comment. I love it. Um, guys, um, and it's another, it's another level of anesthesia. Seriously, once you intubate, it's almost like, why well, I was afraid of the anesthetizing rabbits. <laughs> really, really, it really is. Um, so the other thing I want to say, it's equipment. Because we're going to need to have different equipments, right? We're going to need to have, for example, things like, you know, um, microtubes. So those microtubes um, are those, see here, right here, those are, tiny tubes that come with a DTA, come with heparin, come with serum separator, or they come empty, right? But instead of being those big tubes that we need to put one to two ml of blood at a time, then now those are micro tubes that we can use. Um, usually request them from the lab. You don't need to buy them. And all the countries I've been so far, the lab is the one that is able to provide this for you. Otherwise, guys, Amazon is there. You know, you can buy it. But usually you need to put like 0 0.2, 0.25 mLs of blood. And it's really important that we put the minimum amount of blood, guys, because otherwise it's going to dilute the sample. We can't really trust the results. And that's another thing I want to say. It's a secret, Kami. Kim, so let's go here. The secret is, this is the secret. You with me here on the secret? no cutting corners what i mean by that is um if you use less if you put less blood than is required on the tube your sample will be diluted then you won't know if that patient is for instance um anemic or if it's real 
or if it's diluted or if it's real. So how are you going to treat that patient? How are you going to make decisions, right? So for instance, um, if you also heparinizing syringes, okay, you are diluting. We cannot heparinize syringes. Still telling a secret coming. I know my camera went cray cray, but um, if you are heparinizing syringes, then you can't really trust that result of that sample because it's going to be diluted. If you're collecting from reptiles, for example, if you're collecting from places that can potentially have lymph dilution, and I will tell you more about it, then you cannot trust the sample. Oh, Dr. Branson, but that's the only place I can collect blood from in that animal. That's great, guys. But then... Oh, that's awesome. Okay, guys, bear with us because today is going to be a little bit of a learning curve. Um, I need to, well, I don't know if I do this, if this is going to work. We'll try our best to have the bike on both places. Not going to work. Yeah, I need to open the mic when I go to the other camera. Thank you, Joao. But I was saying that, that, I broke it. I broke it, guys. We're going to do one camera, I think, today because I think I broke it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so again, I was saying, Juan, that there's no cutting corners. So again, I'm saying, Juan, that How did you do this, okay. Luana? <laughs> okay, here. <laughs> Luana is going to figure this out. <laughs> no, just go to the other side. Oh, my God, guys, I promise. This is one day is going to work. I don't know. We, we tried. We rehearsed this. We tried, okay? Believe me. So as I was saying, we do need to, we cannot cut corners. So a simple dilution is a big, big problem when it comes to uh, cutting corners. Because, for example, if you put less volume in the tube that is required and you go like, oh, but I can only collect 0 0.5, 0 0.2. Um, thank you. We can, I can only collect 0 0.2 or 0 0.1 mLs. I can't collect more than 0.1 mLs. Well, then we we can read well first of all with 0.1 ml there's not really a machine that's going to run it but if you use for example a big tube and you put 0.25 ml which is usually the bench analyzer we have in the united states at least called a baxis or vet scan or istat they they can run a sample that's 0.2 ml 0.25 ml of blood but then the problem is if you collect um that and put in a big tube that is for a one ml minimum, you know, sample, then you're gonna dilute. Heparinizing syringes will dilute the sample. Oh, but I saw my friend doing this, but I saw the other veterinarian doing this. We already have evidence-based medicine showing that if you heparinize the the syringe, it does dilute the sample because you having it, the having that um, uh, diluent twice, right? You having the syringe and you have in your tube. So both things now you're diluting. Does it make sense? Oh, Dr. Branson, but I can't collect it fast enough and the sample clots in the tube. Well, we just gonna have to keep trying getting better because cutting corners to get a sample that you can't trust is not really helpful and we shouldn't be doing this, right? We would not do this in a dog or a cat, would we? We wouldn't. And I get it. In dogs and cats, generally, it's easy to collect blood. But think about that kitty that you come that comes that is hypoglycemic. You know, those animals are in shock. We ended up finding a way to do it, right? We train, train, train. We do it. So no cutting corners. That was the secret. Uh, the second thing that we were talking about are the tubes, which you guys are very, very aware already. The tubes, um, and the other thing, guys, that I also want to talk to you are the syringes. OK, so these syringes here usually is very helpful to have syringes that are smaller. So we have and I'm talking about the U.S., maybe perhaps, you know, you have different syringes in your country. Certainly we have different syringes in Brazil. Um, but, you know, some syringes, they the total volume of the syringe. Of course, this happened. Oh, my God. Today is just being. A little bit of a disaster so you guys have to forgive me um 
I will ask you, I will ask your question, uh, Juan, what if I collect with heparin syringes and put sample in plain tube? But the problem is, that's a great question, actually, Juan. But the problem is, how do you know, how do you know how much heparin is in the syringe that we heparinize? Because, right, the heparin is, it needs to be so many mLs of heparin to so many mLs of blood, right? So how many mLs of heparin did you put in the tube? And do you know how many mLs you need to put in the syringe to be a good dilution that's not going to be hemodiluted? That's the problem because you don't have a way to know what exactly is the amount of heparin you have to the amount of blood you need to have for that amount of heparin. Does it make sense? So that's why it's not very helpful. It's not very indicated. Um, now we have this, um, you know, we which again, um, the syringes, they really help. I find them very, very helpful, especially, um, especially the syringes that are 0.3 ml total in volume. Um, they're very helpful because they have, first of all, they have less vacuum. They have less um, sucking power. So they don't collapse small veins. I find them very helpful. Um, also, they usually come with a 27 gauge needle or even smaller. So teeny, teeny, tiny needles, which for teeny tiny animals, such as a hamster, for example, as we asked, becomes very, very useful, right? Now, um, when we are talking about the syringes, some of them are 0 0.3 mLs, some of them are um, 0.5 mLs, some of them are 1 mL, right? Now, what you need to have in consideration here, what you need to think about is that... Um, there are also the syringes called U40s. The U40s, and I want to call your attention to this because the U40s, they usually, um, which are these ones, they have 40 total units. See that? So these ones, for example, oh my God. I sincerely, today is a freaking disaster sorry is my phone ringing um which i'm gonna turn it off which i had thought i had done but anyway this is we are in for a ride so the u40s the problem is it actually carries one ml inside of it so that means in the five or the ten like the five mark is not 0 0.05 mls it's a different unit Total, it's not 0 0.4 ml, it's a 1 ml syringe. Does it make sense? So uh, we really need to be careful with those because you're going to end up collecting way more blood than you should. Okay, so please, please, please be careful with those. They are, if you're using them, you really, really, really need to be careful and pay attention to what you are, um, how much blood you're collecting. Okay, so the anticoagulants, let's go through them very quickly. So anticoagulants, basically, we have um, heparin, right? And then we have EDTA, correct? So um, heparin and EDTA, and I know for a long time, and again, this is one of the parts you guys are going to say, oh my God, Dr. Perenza, that's not how I learned. That's not what I heard. Um, this is what I've been doing my entire life. You know, I don't get it. I don't understand. But this is, I'm going to, what I'm going to relate to you right now is evidence-based medicine. It's not my opinion. It's evidence-based medicine. Okay. So, CB, so let's start with mammals. So the small mammals. So I'm talking about rabbits, chinchillas, guinea pigs, rats, mice, etc. Those, we're going to follow the same standards that we have for dogs and cats. So when you want to learn, a, when you want to run a um, CBC, for example, what you're going to do is a CBC on a ferret. What you're going to do is lavender for CBC, and you're going to do the heparin or the serum separator for biochemistry the same way, okay? On those microtubes, the serum separator is usually the yellow one. So that yellow one right there, 
This is usually the this is the United States. The serum separator, the green is the the dark green is heparin. Um, and then also the lavender top, the purple, light purple, that's um, EDTA, okay? So that's what we're going to do for mammals, very easy, correct? When it comes to birds, it's going to be the same thing, okay? So when we're doing birds, we're going to do the same thing that we do for mammals. So when we're doing birds, uh, say we're collecting from a parrot, then uh, we're also going to use... Um, for CBCs, we're going to use the EDTA. And for biochemists, we're going to use heparin or the serum separator, except for crows. Okay, crows, they are different. Crows, their blood hemolyzes with EDTA. So we need to use heparin for them. Okay, you guys get it? So crows and the bird world. Well, I'm only talking to you guys about the pets. Of course, there are the exceptions when we start talking about wild birds and a terra but for pet birds usually the crows are the only ones that we're gonna encounter that require different type of, of um anticoagulant now for the reptiles and that's where <laughs> that's where the confusion happens right for the reptiles there are differences okay so for the reptiles let me take a sip of water Today has been great. And if you guys are still there, thank you so much for enduring this with me. I promise you the next one is going to be better. But, you know, failure is control practice. And this is control practice. The, the contents of this are not changing. The content is still amazing. We're trying to figure out a different way. And every time we try this. Oh, and then, you know what? This is important. Every time, you, every time you try something different, something better, you're going to fail. Okay, this is going to happen in your practice. When you go and collect blood, even though I'm teaching you all of this and you go there, you are going to fail. And that is a okay as long as it's controlled practice. As long as you know what you're doing, as long as you don't putting anyone in danger, is controlled practice. Failure is okay. It's the way we learn. Okay, and if you're not okay with failure, then you're not okay with life because that's life. And today I'm actually laughing about it because we rehearse so much. We spend countless hours trying all of this. And of course, when it comes to the day, and I already told the girls before, I said, it's going to be a mess. And it is. And it's fun. And we are laughing about it, right? So it's going to be the same thing, same thing when you go practice. Now for reptiles, guys, what happens is there are some reptiles that you should use well, let me go a step back. Um, so culturally speaking, when we go to do uh, blood sampling reptiles, the anticoagulants that we were taught to use at school, at least I was taught, um, was heparin for ADTA. Remember for yeah. mammals and birds, we use heparin for ADTA. Did I really say that? Heparin for CBC. For, rept for birds and mammals, we use ADTA, correct? For CBCs, for complete blood counts. For reptiles, culturally, we've been taught to use heparin instead of ADTA. But here's the catch. The more we learn, the more studies we have, the more we realize that the, for a lot of species, the best anticoagulant for a CBC is actually ADTA. We already know that, for example, with iguanas, we have study on iguanas, box turtles. We know that we need to use ball pythons. We know we need to use a DTA because they sample lies, they suffer lysis when we are um, using heparin. So we should be using a DTA. So uh, what I advise you is to keep a, little, as a list of the animals. We actually provide the list for you in our emergency course. We have it there. Yes. Mind blown. I agree. Um, in our course, in our ebook, we have that list for you. We just need to print and put on your wall. That's what I do because I, well, by now I memorize, of course, but in the beginning, that's what I did. And that's what I do on the practice. I go train. Um, so, and the other thing is, um, Chinese water dragons is the same thing too, guys. Chinese water dragons, 
um, also we should be using a DTA. So what I usually do, I call the lab that I'm sending the samples to and I tell them, say, okay, I, because we don't have studies in all species, you know, and the more we study, the more we see that they might be different. So what I do is I call the lab and I say, hey, can we do something? I am going to, when possible, I am going to send you two samples for CBC. I'm going to send you um, a sample in a DTA and a sample in heparin. Then that's for CBC, complete good blood count. Then the lab is going to run a PCV on both samples. And the sample that yields the highest PCV is the one they're going to do the CBC on. Because we don't have studies for everything. I know that sounds like a lot. Um, but, you know, once you start implementing it, it becomes second nature. That's what I usually do, okay? Um, so are you guys with me? Let me see here the comments. Um, I think so. Um, okay, I think we have, and I think I have answered all your questions. Um, okay, guys, so continue here. Um, also, if you guys see um, ducks, you know, I just remember that sometimes you might see ducks you know, for um, when you in some practices, you might see ducks, you might see chickens. Um, and on those um, ducks, for example, um, also the cranes, the hornbills, um, we also, it's like the crows, we also need to use heparin. So if you see ducks, if you see horn, hornbills, I think is a little bit, unless you, you know, it's someone that has a collection at home. Um, then again, hornbills, cranes, duck, geese, swans, the Hoanatidae family and the crows and ravens, those all need to be, uh, we need to use heparin instead of a DTA for a CBC, okay? Uh, time more, oh, hi, he's always here, thank you. Should we sedate every time as in tortoise, it can be tricky sometimes and how much we will affect the fine feeding metabolism. Uh, so this is what I do, okay? This is what I do. Um, I usually will try, so tortoises, as you guys know, chelones in general can be very challenging because we're going to learn the place of sampling it should be the juggler. Um, but then it can become very tricky. I totally agree. Um, and then I will usually try if it is easy because sometimes the animal is so sick that I can easily hold the neck out, then I will not sedate. Now, if I cannot hold the neck out, I will sedate, especially because I also need to examine the oral cavity if I for a complete physical exam. So I will sedate them and then I will lightly sedate them because all I'm trying to do is open the mouth to look inside of the mouth for my physical exam. And also I'm trying to collect blood. So I'm trying to extend the neck. So I lightly sedate them and it does not affect their metabolism. They'll be sleepy probably for a few hours, but that's about it. It is Valens. How are you doing? So long. We haven't seen you. So at the moment, crows are the only ones to use heparin tubes. Well, crows... So if we're talking about, oh, okay, heard the others. <laughs> good, good. But just just in case, again, um, crows, the Natidae family, which are the swans, the ducks, uh, the geese, and then the cranes and hornbills, in case you see them. Um, sometimes we do see them as, you know, some people have them as collectors. Okay, let's talk about sample size okay sample size guys um that is again one thing that we have a lot of questions about right so usually as a rule of thumb as a rule of thumb we can collect safely 10 percent of the blood volume okay so what is the blood volume of an animal as a rule of thumb you'll see that that like slide, <laughs> LOL, thank you, miss you, I miss you too. Um, so usually as a rule of thumb, an animal, so if you want to know the blood volume of a patient, of an animal, we're talking about 10% of the body weight. So say you have a parrot, like my Coco, which is screaming at the background, she's an African gray parrot. She's about 300, let's say 400 grams, okay? She's 400 grams. So I know that she has in blood volume 40 mLs of blood. Okay. 400 grams, 10% of 400 is 40. Okay. You cut a zero. So she has 40 mLs of blood running through her little sassy body. Okay. So we can collect safely 
10% of the blood volume. So if her blood volume is 40 mLs, I can safely collect 4 mLs from her. Okay? 10% of 40 is 4. You cut a 0. So 4 mLs. So long story short, that means that I can safely collect 1% of the body weight. So if cocoa is 400 grams, I can safely collect 1% of that, which is 4 mLs. Okay. Do you hear me, Coco? Keep screaming. I'm going to collect all your blood. Um, okay. Of course, guys, there are some um, exceptions. If the animal is super, if a, if a patient is super sick, of course, we want to collect less. Uh, for instance, this week I was going to a surgery I knew was going to uh, have some bleeding. Then, you know, I collect way less than I can or just the bare minimal I need. If you need to do multiple collections, for instance, you're checking the ionized calcium or the glucose ionized calcium on a on a you know reptile with metabolic bone disease. We're checking that uh, cereal, like you know, cereal samples, you want to collect the bare minimal and write it down the amount you're collecting. Okay. Because then you know the total. You're like, okay, oh my God, I already collected 10 emails because I've been collecting one email, one email, one email. Okay. So I think about that. Now for birds, for example, um, <clears throat> it's, it depends on the birds, but I know I told you the rule of thumb that 10% of the body weight is the blood volume. So it varies somewhere between 6 and 12%. It really depends on the, the type of bird, okay? But at 10% of the body weight is a good thing. For reptiles, it can vary between 5 and 8%. So the reptile's blood volume varies <clears throat> from five to eight percent. Again, on a peach is really, really on a peach is very, very okay to use the ten percent rule. Uh, but if you want to be more precise, five to eight percent, okay. Uh, so just keep those things into consideration <clears throat> when we're doing this for rabbits, for example. Let me sip a little bit of water. It can be somewhere between six percent and seven percent of the body weight, the blood volume. Again, 10% um, is completely okay, okay? If you're running a lot of tests, then what is the minimal sample size? It continues to be the 10% of the blood volume, okay, Camila? Um, now, you're going to need to take in consideration, for instance, say you do today <clears throat> uh, biochemistry in a bird and the uric acid is... 20 is very high. Like, okay, I test cocoa and her uric acid is 15. It's high. Okay. So we're going to put her on fluids, etc. And, you know, I use 0.25 ml of blood to run a sample, the sample to run a test. So I write it down that today, sometimes you're going to collect blood more than one time a day, right? So I usually say, okay, oh, today's day. So October 17th, I collected, or October 18th, I collected point. 25 ml of blood. So I'm going to put her on fluids, IV fluids. Tomorrow I'm going to collect again. Okay. So tomorrow I write it down 0 0.25 ml, which total is 0.5 ml. Okay. So now you go like, okay, but how long can I keep doing this? Well, we know that birds in general, okay, general, it's very, it's very, it's very dangerous to generalize, but in general, birds, they make new red blood cells within three days. So I know when that three day mark comes, I kind of have new blood cells. So I kind of knew I can start it over again, the count, kind of zero the count, okay? Uh, of course, if the bird is sick, it's not going to be three days. You need to give maybe a week, okay? So you know that. Um, and then you need to do the same thing for the other animals. Does it make sense? Cool. Let's go for collection sites because that's what we all want to see, right? So collection sites, let us start with rabbits okay let's start with rabbits which is going to be the same uh basically for uh, the majority of the mammals uh but for rabbits i do want i do want to show you one tip i have which is to collect from the venous lateral uh cephanous vein so here as you can see here what i <clears throat> i will answer your question so joan so we can collect one percent of body weight every three days Yes and no. That's for birds, I'm assuming you're talking about. Um, so the short answer to it is yes, but, big but there. Um, but if your patient is sick, you definitely don't want to collect the max amount and you want to give it more time. So I would potentially give it a week, 
okay? Five to seven days. So for rabbits, the, the places that we can collect blood are very similar to dogs and cats. So, you know, cephalic vein, jugular vein, lateral cephalus vein. However, with the patient awake, there's only really awake and and alert, right? Because if the patient is collapsed, then it changes. Or if he's really lethargic, it changes. But with the patient alert, a rabbit, the only place I actually try to collect blood from is the lateral saphenous vein. And the reason I do that is because I really like to use these type of restraint right here. So it's going to look a little bit weird, okay? But as you can see on this one, you, I am having the patient uh, being held by putting a hand under the person, like the, one of the person's arm, the handler's arm is under the bunny. It's not holding the leg. You see the leg is hanging. And the other hand of the handler, the other arm is on top of the bunny and the handler is putting the head of the bunny, kind of the armpit, like the elbow, sorry, kind of hiding that. And... So as you can see, the leg is literally hanging there, okay? So the person that is going to collect the blood is going to use the non-dominant hand. In my case, I, I write with my right hand, okay? So I put my left hand on the top of the base of the leg, at the base of the leg. I pour alcohol. As you can see there, that the leg is not shaved. It's alcohol. And allows you to see the vein, the lateral saphenous, which is way higher than in dogs and cats. It's like in the middle of the thigh, right? You can see there. So the left hand is holding off the vein and holding the leg at the base. We're not holding the tip of the leg. We're not holding the paw, the feet, I should say. Because if you do that, they're going to kick. Uh, and then we can injure the spine sometimes. But there's a whole other conversation. I don't also want to be you to be afraid of that. It can happen, but it's not that common if you do it properly. Um, so again, you are going to do that. Um, and then with your right hand, in my case, my dominant hand is the right, I am going to collect the sample. So this is how it's going to happen. I'm going to show you a video right now, okay? I want you guys to see a video on how that happens. So let's show you so basically i know it's gonna so look a little bit weird in the beginning but uh can you guys hear coco she's like literally this is the first time this person is collecting blood so we put alcohol on the leg okay and now she is holding the syringe identified the the vein with the left hand she's holding off the vein and holding the leg of the animal this animal is not sedating and she's pulling the blood at the same time see that she's holding the syringe you just need to train your hand to pull the plunge uh, we using the same hand this is the first time this person is collecting blood from a rabbit okay so that's how we do it um so very very cool the other sites, especially the jugular vein, I will only attempt if, if the patient is sedated. I really do not attempt that if the patient is not sedated. Um, let me show you. I think I have another video here. Let me show you as well. Um, but again, as you can see, oh, I think this is the same video, my friends. <laughs> um, I really like this technique. I really, really do like this technique. Okay, so when you're now talking about other mammals, right? So say <laughs> our um, ferrets. When it comes to ferrets, and this is the only, really only species that's safe to collect blood uh, from the uh, Crino Vena Cava, okay? Um, because, and the reason is because they are hard. Here, as you can see on this illustration, by the way, all these illustrations are proprietary from Vetahead. Um, and we um, have all of them on our ebook. It is really, really cool. So, in fair, it's the heart. It's very, very caudal, as you can see. Woo, that go this way. So, see, very caudal right here. Woo, woo. So that's why it's safe to collect from the crino vena cava. As you can see here, the needle, we, other side, we. 
<laughs> uh, that's why we can collect. Now, let me tell you this. If you're not experienced with that, with collecting blood from ferrets, then sedate your ferret. Okay, butorphanol does wonders. Um, just go ahead and collect using butorphanol. Um, again, sedation is not the point of our um, our lecture today, our talk today. Um, our courses show everything, but sedate them. If you're not experienced sedate them, you definitely don't want to be playing around the crinovino cave. You can really do good damage, okay, including death if you are if the patient is wiggling around. Now, if you are a experienced handler, then things change. Um, for example, I do um, I do like to collect from this site as the, my go-to site. This is how we restrain them to collect the blood. So pretty much like you guys uh, do with cats, right? So your dominant hand, the handler dominant hand is scruffing the animal on the nape of the neck. And we are stretching, uh, we are stretching that ferret. Um, as you can see here, we're stretching that ferret and pulling the arms down. You see that? Um, so that's how we're going to do. Now I do want to, so I usually let them sleep. You put them, um, you put them in the, in the carrier, et cetera. Um, and Camila, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to talk to you guys about that. And I do not recommend that. Um, Crina Vena Cave is only for ferrets, no hedgehogs, no guinea pigs, no, no other animal. Okay. Um, when you experience a uh, blood collector from a ferret, what I usually do, I let them sleep in the care. If you put them in the care and cover them with a towel, they fall asleep very quickly because uh, during the day, they usually are sleeping. And so I wait for the moment they fall asleep and then I grab them and then the handler holds. And it's a very quick procedure. But um, And you also do not want to give food to... Um, no, so people will have them leak some type of food, usually rich in su sugar, so they can do, don't do that. That changes the blood the blood sugar concentration. And blood glucose is something you definitely want to know in a ferret, okay? So if you're collecting blood, don't do that. Now, if you're doing abdominal ultrasound or something like that, by all means, have that distraction with food, but not if you're collecting blood, okay? Um, so here, um, what we also want to keep in mind are the landmarks. So I'm going to tell you right now. So you're gonna find the the enters the um, where the sternum starts right at the base of the neck. You're gonna find that, as you can see there in the picture, on this one in this illustration right here. So you find that bone right here, right? Then if you run your finger to the side, you're gonna find a little groove where is the first rib. That's where you are going to um, have as a landmark to place your needle. Okay. Um, then, let me see, I think I have a video to show you. Then you're going to aim. Eh, la, 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 video of the ferret. Do we not have a come here? This is a ferret. I can really tell. It is a ferret. Okay. Let me show you this video so then you're gonna aim we're gonna enter with the needle at about you know uh, 45 degree angle you see i feel that groove and i'm gonna put the needle as if i was going to the opposite back leg okay so i'm feeling that groove right there Felt the groove, then I'm gonna insert the needle. In this case, I'm using a butterfly catheter, but you can also go straight with the needle. I'm gonna put in a 40, 45 degree angle, aiming for the opposite back leg, and then we collect the blood. Okay, again, aiming for the opposite, so it's in an angle, right? In a, in a line, an oblique line going to the opposite pelvic limb. So, for example, if you are, um, if you are entering, so you, you've identified the bone, you've identified the groove, and you are entering from the right side, you're aiming for the left leg. Does it make sense? Another very important thing, guys, please, I'm going to tell you a secret. And this time the camera is on <laughs> and the microphone is on. Do not keep fishing. If you do in Crino Vena Cave, can, you cannot keep fishing and redirecting. You might lacerate it. If you can't hit it, you need to bring it all the way back and try again, okay? 
So that's what we do for ferrets. Okay, everybody with me still? So now, Camila, I think, just asked about hedgehogs. So what do we do for hedgehogs? Where do we can collect? I know that you might have seen people collecting from the Kirna Vena Cava. Again, this, this is all... I mean, I love this, this illustration. Look at this hedgehog, guys. No, seriously, seriously. I'm going to leave the camera so you can see. Look at this. It's the cutest thing ever. Okay. As you can see here in the illustration, blip. I am not, col I'm not proposing you collect from the Kuna Vena Cava. I'm proposing you collect from the jugular. And why is that? They are hard. It's very cranial. It's not caudal like the, guinea like the ferret. Okay, you can definitely lacerate that. You can definitely do an intercardiac in, uh, collection and lacerate and kill the hedgehog. How do I know that? I've done it. Okay, I've done it. And I don't want you to do the same thing. Okay, so the only safe place if you want to collect from a large vessel is the jugular, not the crinovina cava. Ah, Dr. Bryce, but I did it many times. Nothing ever happened. Me too, guys. I've done it multiple times. Nothing ever happened until it happened. And then I had to give the news to that owner and I was doing a wellness examination, a perfectly healthy hedgehog. And then the hedgehog died. How do you explain that? Okay. So why run the risk? Why? With, when all you have to do is sedate and collect from the juggler. Well, you're going to need to sedate anyway to collect from the Cunevina Cava. Obviously, hedgehogs turn into a ball. But you can also collect from the juggler. You can collect from the lateral saphenous vein. Ooh, the other way. Lateral saphenous vein right here. Guys, this is the opposite. That's why I look like a crazy person. So right here, lateral saphenous, love it. Femoral vein, love it. Jugular vein, whoop. We jugular vein. This is kind of cool. And the weather is... I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm having too much fun with this. Um, okay. Got it? Got it, Camila? Thank you for your question. Amazing. Now, are you ready for this illustration? Because this is like oh, the cutest thing. I know I say they're all cute, but they, they are all cute. What can I do? Okay. Uh, the next one I want to talk to you guys are our sugar gliders. Okay. Sugar glider, same thing. Love a jugular. Love a jugular. Okay. Definitely recommend that um, for you guys. Jugular vein. But we can all hear, we calma. This way. There you go. Jugular vein. Not crina vena cava, juggler vein, cephalic is going to be a little hard, but you can. It's going to be a little uh, hard. Lateral saphenous is all, it's good for almost all animals, seriously. And femoral vein, I also love it. Sedated, of course. I don't know about you guys, but they are uh, kind of <laughs> difficult creatures, right? They just got it. Okay, um, so they need to be sedated. Majority of sites. Now, let's talk about our um, group of reptiles very quick. So reptiles, guys, it de depends on the type of reptile, right? But one of the big things with reptiles is lymph contamination, right? So usually um, they don't have lymph nodes, but they do have lymph, ve lymph vessels. So um, usually they run together or side by side with the veins and arteries. Again, it can become very, very tricky to collect blood from them without having lymph contamination. And what is the problem with lymph contamination? The problem is your sample is going to be diluted. Then when you do a PCV through solids and erythrocyte count, and yes, guys, if you're not doing an erythrocyte count, can you explain to me why? This is what I ask all the labs. They go like, oh, we don't, we don't run erythrocyte counts in reptiles and birds. I say, do you run in mammals? They go like, yeah, of course. And I was like, so why are you not running for Zoomet patients, for reptiles and birds? I, I just, is this data not important? We are not for birds and reptiles. So they're important for mammals, but they're not important for birds and reptiles. They go like, yeah, I said, that makes no sense. And the reason is, guys, that they don't want to do it is because it's manual. It's a manual count. You can't run through the machine because they are, uh, Red blood cells have a uh, nucleus. So you need to do it manually. So they don't want to do it manually, right? But I will tell you this. When you have a patient that is extremely, this is one scenario only, okay? If you have a patient that's extremely dehydrated, duh, almost all our patients, they're sick. And then you get a, a PCV that's, let's say on a reptile, a PCV that's like, you know, 
ten percent, which is like lower lim lower limit depending on the reptile you're talking about. How do you know if that patient is um anemic or not because if it is really dehydrated it's going to be hemoconcentrated and you're going to have um and you're going to have a higher pcv that's falsely elevated because the animal is dehydrated so you need the red blood count right for that's just one example do you have a picture drawing uh, from the femoral vein location in what animal in what animal um Okay, guys, so from Chelonians, the only place that we can collect without lymph contamination is jugular vein, okay? That's the only place. And that means that very likely we're going to be needing to sedate all our patients or the majority of them. Dr. Proenza, but I've seen collected from the tail vein, dorsal coccygeal vein. Me too. I've done it. But it comes with lymph contamination. There's no way to tell. There's no way to tell. And even if there's a way to tell how much lymph contamination you have, 5%, 10%, how are you going to do it? Now, for biochemistry, that might be okay because in theory, the lymph and the blood have the same biochemical analytes. So for biochemistry, it might be okay. But for a complete blood count, no. <coughs> PCV, no. Okay. How oh, Dr. Brian I collect from the brachial sinus. Guys, I know. It's great. But it's just not trustworthy. We cannot trust that sample. So it can be super easy. But if you can't use that sample, <coughs> what good that is, right? Mm. Hedgehog, I do have pictures, but not on this lecture. If you're part of our community, that's a place where you can have more access to me and my colleagues, and we can share things like that, for example. That's something you easily could ask on the community, and you will, and it will be able to share with you. Um, then the last place I want to talk to you about, about that is not even here on my illustrations, as you can see. Dr. Brian said, you forgot the coccygeal you know, uh, sinus, you forgot, so, sorry, the supercarpatial sinus, you forgot that, which is like, you know, right, right at the top of the carapace. I didn't forget it, guys. Blood collection from that place, one, almost 100% of the times has lymph contamination. Two, you can damage the vertebrae. And this is not a place we should be collecting blood. I know it's frustrating because it's easy to collect blood from there. <laughs> But you can, one, damage the ribbit. Two, it's always lymph contaminated, okay? Do not do that, guys. Okay, um, now running for our, when you're talking about lizards, okay? So for lizards, um, we have a few things that I want to talk to you about. One, juggler vein is, woo, the other side, juggler vein is... Awesome. Okay, juggler vein. And you also can use transillumination. You can put some light, especially the geckos, because they have light skin. You can put light underneath the neck and it actually highlights like it shadows. The 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 vein will have a shadow. So you can actually see it. Juggler vein. I love it. I'll have a video to show you. Um also tail vein. Tail vein is possible, okay. <coughs> However, in lizards that can do autotomy, the geckos and the iguanas, I usually, one, tell the owner that that's, that can happen if I'm collecting blood from that location. But two, I don't do without sedating them. Oh, Dr. Prince, but I've done any iguanas and the tail never fell off. I've done it too. It never fell off too either. But I don't want to be the first one to give a tail in one hand and the lizard on the other hand, okay? So once I started making mistakes that cost the life of the animal, <coughs> I started being way more strict with that because one, it crushes our heart and two, I don't want to be the one causing that for a blood sample. So I do sedate them, okay? And the juggler, actually, you don't need to sedate them. The juggler in iguanas is humongous. 
humongous, okay? It, there is a small learning curve. So what you want to do for the jugular vein, and um, I'll show you a video right now. Um, you want to hold the animal in lateral position. They don't need to be sedated. And then you want to lower the head to expose the neck. Head. See? And then you're gonna aim kind of for the the shoulder, and is depending on the lizard, it's kind of superficial. And then it's a blind stick, okay? That's what I'm showing there uh, to you guys right there, um, as you can see right there. There you go. Um, you go aiming for that shoulder. You stretching the neck, and the neck, the head is kind of facing down, and you can collect large amounts from that. Of course, in this animal, for example, this patient, because the money shot, okay. because the skin is so pigmented, trans elimination becomes a little hard, right? But um, of course, if you're using like if you have a, a gecko, then it becomes way easier, okay? Now, when we were talking about lizards and tails, so we also have, for example, bearded dragons, right? That they don't do autotomy on the tail. And so collecting from the juggler is okay, but also collecting from the tail, it's very okay. So here you're seeing me collecting from a tail, a tail of a gecko. Always guys scrub before, I didn't say that, but for all animals, we use alcohol to scrub. Um, but Basically, also, depending if I'm collecting from the tail, I don't do just alcohol. I usually do chlorhexidine scrub because they always like, you know, that tail is always rubbing in feces and whatnot. So here, um, as you can see, I'm holding the tail with my hand, kind of scooping the tail so it doesn't move. Um, and I am going right in the middle. Okay, you're going to insert your needle at about 30 to 40 degrees. Um, sometimes a little bit more sharp of an angle and you're going to go very slowly until you're going to find resistance or you're going to hit the the bone in the tail, right? Um, and then the vertebrae. So then you're going to be very gentle and you're going to bring your needle slightly back and collect your sample, okay? As you can see here, I have the bearded dragon up because then gravity helps me. Uh, so the blood is going to the tail, Okay. So that's another thing that we can definitely do. Now, moving to our... Are you guys good? Any questions so far? Are we all good? I see here on the questions. Okay, seems like you guys are all good. So here for snakes, okay, for snakes, um, we actually have two places we can collect blood from, Okay. We one is the heart, which is very safe in snakes. Okay, the other one is the tail vein. Oops, this way, this way, that way, <laughs> that way. So, the tail vein now, ball pythons, for example, or other snakes that have very short tails, the tail vein is like really, really hard. <laughs> All good, as Julie says. Um, so that be can become tricky. <clears throat> also, the tail vein is possible that comes with lymph, just so you know. So usually I do the heart. Okay, so just like we talked about in uh, ferrets, remember we said don't redirect the needle, don't keep fishing. It's the same thing when you collect from the heart of snakes, okay? The same thing. We're not going to be fishing. We're not going to be redirecting the needle. We need to have the animal really well restrained. You don't need to sedate, but if you want, you can, okay? Then I'm going to show you a video here of uh, collecting. Now, one good, so one rule of thumb is if you divide the snake in three thirds, usually to the middle, to the caudal end of the first third is the location of the heart, okay? As you can see here. Got it? It depends on the species. That's why I'm giving you kind of these ranges. Also, if you have the snake, if you hold the snake with the belly up, you can see the heart beating. Okay, let me try to show you guys a video. And also can use the ultrasound or the Doppler to find the location of the heart. Okay, if you look there, you're going to be able to see it um, beating. Oops, play. Need to hit play, otherwise it won't play. 
So it is, um, you finally identify where the heart is beating, okay? And then <clears throat> we're gonna, what I really, really like to do, I like to scoop, um, I really like to scoop the, I'm trying to find the picture here to show you guys. Um, mm -hmm, let me find the video. Is this the video? We're not sure. Let's take a look. So I like to scoop the body of the snake where the heart is. There you go. With my non-dominant hand. Then I introduce, I scrub the area. I introduce again about 45 degree angle, a very small needle. Don't fish it. Okay. Then I pull the plunge. And if blood comes, great. If blood doesn't come... I can yeah, go in and out, but I cannot keep fishing. You go between the scales. Every time you're collecting blood from a reptile, you go between the scales, not through the scales. To, okay? To if you want to use the ultrasound, it's just like if you were collecting from the bladder, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you're going to use the same technique. Um, then you can definitely do that. I definitely uh, recommend you doing that. Uh, because it's going to help you, especially if you don't have experience, that's going to be something really, really, really helpful. Okay. Um, from our chelonians, as I said, we can definitely collect from the jugular vein. And uh, here's a tip for you. This is a huge aldabra tortoise, but the reason I want to show you this picture is, is because you can use, um, you can use this technique of putting the head down. So a, as you can see, there's a table there, right? And the animal's on the table and we are kind of tilting the animal in a way that the head is angling down. So the blood goes to the head and usually makes the jugular pop because holding off these veins, unfortunately, doesn't help much. So I really like to do that. Um, now here we have a video for you collecting from the jugular um and again is usually requires sedation to collect from these babies and the jugular vein in chelonians if you find the scale the tympanic scale or the ear if you trace a line you find the the jugular vein okay so he's collecting from a radius slider i'm uh twisting the neck in a sense that he's showing me the lateral aspect of the neck um and then i'm collecting the blood from that location okay um let me see if i have uh some other interesting videos to show you but i think i show you them all oh i do want to show you an interesting picture um oh this is what not to do okay not to do the subcarpation sinus we are not collecting blood from there but this is just um showing what the, the location this is collecting from the tail vein again scrub a lot if you're going to collect from this place and i usually only use it if i need i rarely use it seriously rarely because the thought of putting bacteria introducing bacteria in that vein there because there's always poop in urine there as much as we scrub there's always a little bit i usually don't use it but if I'm really, 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 really need to use it, can't collect from anywhere else, I might collect it for biochemistry, okay? Um, this is collecting from the jugular vein of a iguana. As you can see, the technique is the same. So I'm holding the animal in lateral recumbency, pulling the arm uh, to the back, right? Stretching the animal. The neck is facing, it's kind of bended down. The, neck, the head is facing down. And as you can see with the needle, I'm aiming for the shoulder, Okay. It is a learning curve. It took me a little bit, but once you learn, it's really cool. And I was like, I don't know why I didn't. And it always started to, for me, when I did, I was doing, I always tried to do necropsies on my patients that die or that are euthanized. And then for some reason, one time I was opening the neck, which I usually don't do. And I saw this huge jugular vein. I was like, oh, why am I not using this vein? Um, he is showing transillumination. I told you guys, see, this is a gecko, a leopard gecko. So if you, you can see the vein right there, right? Super cool, huh? You can see the vein right there. Um, very, very easy to see. Very, very tiny. I'm holding the head, uh, but still very cool. Collecting from the tail um, and that we already talked about. Now, last but not least, 
Uh, let's talk about birds. And for birds here, um, one, it, it depends how much blood you need to collect and also how, um, if your patient is awake or not awake, okay? The first place that is the one I really, really, really recommend you guys all use is the jugular vein. So one thing to know here is that the jugular vein of birds, and we're talking more about parrots here, the right side is usually larger than the left side. That doesn't mean that you can collect from the left side. You can definitely collect from the left side. But usually the right side, the vein is a little larger. Um, and I like to do it better. How do you manage to restrain iguana like that? <laughs> uh, all the ones I've done are really crazy, always wanting to bite. I will go back to that, Camila. <laughs> Fair question. <laughs> I love it. I have so much fun with you guys. I love interacting with you. I really, really do. Um, okay, so I like to burrito parrots. Um, I burrito them with a towel. I leave just the neck and the head out. All the rest of the, the bird is burritoed. Remember, we cannot restrain the chest. The chest is to be able to go up and down so they can breathe. But then I do that. And they don't have feathers right here. So all you have to do is put a little bit of alcohol. And you can definitely see um, where you're collecting the, vet, uh, the blood from. Um, I believe I do have a, a video. Oh, I don't have a video from the jugular. No, can't believe it. Sorry, guys. I do have a video, but for some reason, it's not showing here. Um, and then the um, Camila found it, maybe. Ooh. That's from that. That's from the. Thank you, Camila. But that's from the. The owner vein, which is the next one. I'm gonna. You can leave it there. Is the next one I'm gonna talk about. But for some reason, the. The juggler one didn't come, but that's okay. That's okay. Guys, we're going to have different opportunities. And again, on our VETA head courses, all the videos play without any kings, without any problems, very high quality. Okay. You need to take my word, not take my word, just watch some of the samples we have on YouTube, on our website. You will see it. Um, the the owner vein, which is right here, it is a good place to collect blood, but with the bird awake, sometimes I will, but it is really hard because they flap the wings and also um, it, it, you will have huge hematomas usually. I even tell the owners that. For here, the neck, none of the places you need to plug feathers, you can just put a little bit of alcohol. Don't pour, don't wash the bird with alcohol, but then you can see the veins. I also love the medial metatarsal vein. I love it for catters. See this vein right here for IV catters is the bomb. I love it. Um, and then from the owner vein, that's the video I'm going to show you guys now. But um, again, um, it's usually I do when they're sedated. Um, I love to place catters there as well. Mm -hmm. It's my second favorite place, but I usually have the suture mm -hmm. that I'm collecting. It's kind of here, uh, you know, <clears throat> And then the, the distal owner, um, and it's very good to collect blood from there. Um, my friends, I do want to, <laughs> I do want to, we are getting to the end of it today. I do want to say I'm really sorry about, um, you know, all the kinks that we had today. Um, uh, I know that it was a lot, <laughs> But uh, we are trying something new. We're going to get better with time. Um, some of the things we tried today worked very well. Um, and I'm very pleased with them. Some of them need improvement, uh, but we're working on this. Um, and if you're patient with us, uh, we need to definitely work on the second camera. I mean, we definitely need to work for the videos to pass without jamming. So we're going to get there. Um, but I think this is better than showing slides. I don't like that PowerPoint image and, and I'm always in the little corner. I don't like that. I want to change that. So if you guys have any suggestions, any like platforms that you use, you know, it works, uh, but anything, but please know we're trying. Show us a love. If you're still here, show us a love. Go to the post on our Instagram Uh Camila, I don't know if you have time to put the link for Instagram on the comments, but just go there, say you were here, tell us what you learned today, show us some love, because the more we interact with us, the more we understand what you're liking and the more we can do. Um, and if you love our content, 
uh, please consider joining our VetAhead membership. It's, um, it's a one-year membership that you can keep renewing every time. We uh, Every year we have uh, new courses, new content. So it's not like you're paying to see the same thing, quite the opposite. And we every year we update our ebook. So uh, for example, our rabbit is already on the third edition of the ebook, always with the new information, new um, studies. The Vet Ahead membership, you have access to all our online courses. It is material and way more, but in a very professional way. Uh, so it's super cool. Our ebooks, illustrations, pictures, videos, step by steps. It's really cool. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, let me know if you have any questions um oh camila posted here um uh our instagram link and the comments if you copy you can paste that and goes directly to the post that talks about this this um webinar and then you can show us some love um what's the price for the membership this is actually oh sorry <laughs> uh, Ashley, thank you so much. Learn a lot per usual. Oh my God, I love. It. I miss you guys. Actually, I need to go there to visit. Can we? I just want to go say hi to you, visit you guys. I really miss you guys. Can we schedule that? Guys, Ashley is the amazing manager of one of the hospitals I train here. They are amazing. They do amazing things, seriously. Um, what is the price for the membership for students that maybe? Thank you for that question. We actually had a 50% discount for students. <clears throat> um, so our membership that two ways you can pay is either uh, what you pay one time fee that is worth for a year four hundred twenty dollars US dollars for the whole year and you can renew and should renew every year or you can pay thirty five dollars per month um, for one year. But for students, if you go there, uh, Kami, if you don't mind putting the that oh my god. Camila read my mind. She already has the link here for you. Uh, so for students, you have 50% discount. And that's for vet students, tech students, okay? You have 50% discount. So you go there and you just need to upload your student ID. Um, it has all the information there for you. And then you get a 50% discount for one year. It's really, really cool. Guys, thank you so much. As usual, I promise you, you're going to get better and better and better at this. Um, we are just learning as we go. Thank you for being here as usual. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, guys.